In my last lecture, I talked about post-impressionists. Now I'm going to finish up the 19th century and move into the 20th century with the collection of movements that are sometimes lumped together as fin de siècle, which is just French for end of the century. Symbolism was actually a more important movement in literature and music than in art. Poets such as Baudelaire and composers such as Debussy thought that art should spring from the emotions, from the artist's inner spirit, and the best guide to the inner spirit was thought to come in dreams. Not accidentally, this was also the period when Sigmund Freud began to explore the ways that dreams reveal our hidden fears and desires. So I'm skipping over a whole bunch of symbolists whom I've never considered all that interesting, so thanks for once to the College Board. But here's just one example to give you an idea of this particular ism. Redon was drawn to fantasy and the macabre, again, that unseen world of the psyche. If you notice that sex is a pervasive theme in these paintings, well, welcome to Unit 12 and the Modern Age. This entire unit should probably get an R rating. I should probably skip this artist too, but I like him too much. Henri Rousseau was a self-taught primitive or naive painter who was much admired by avant-garde post-impressionist and expressionist artists, including Picasso, even though he worked alone without association with other artists. In fact, he was a little baffled by the attention and admiration he got. Rousseau's paintings are very recognizable for their sharp lines, their painstaking detail, and their magical subject matter. The term avant-garde is one you should know. It refers to in military terms, to scouts who go out ahead of the troops, but artists embrace it to show that they were paving the way ahead of their time. I'm showing you a couple more Rousseau paintings, mostly because I like them. I suspect you'll like them too. But speaking of dreams, let's hear from our next presenter. As always, I hope I'm not just repeating what you just heard. Art historians struggle over where Munch fits into this parade of isms. His swirling lines seem reminiscent of Van Gogh, especially in Van Gogh's more unbalanced moments. The expressive as opposed to realistic colors also point to fellow uh, to post-impressionists such as Gauguin. The dreamscape, for surely this is some kind of bad dream, points to the influence of symbolism. Munch was a Norwegian painter who won a government scholarship to study in Paris, where he encountered post-impressionist and symbolist works. He was especially taken with Gauguin, who arguably fits into both schools. Munch then moved to Germany as Expressionism was beginning to grip the avant-garde German artists. Stay tuned for the next lecture. As for what was going on in his head, the quote on this slide recounts how Munch himself discussed describes his vision on the bridge. The painting portrays a real place. It was actually a favorite local spot for committing suicide, near an insane asylum for women, supposedly near enough to hear the inmates screaming. Charming. The scream was actually part of a series that Munch called The Freeze of Life, paintings that address the central themes of love, sexual anxiety, and death. So here are a few more paintings in the series. As you've probably guessed, Munch had a very ambivalent attitude toward women who both intrigued and terrified him. We'll see more of that. Is Dr. Freud in the house? And now, finally, we cross that great siècle divide and move into the 20th century. You learned about this work over the summer, which now seemed like a long time ago, doesn't it? So let's hear again from one of your classmates. Again, I'm probably repeating what you just heard, but Klimt was a member of the Austrian secessionist movement, so named because these painters seceded from Austria's conservative art establishment and its version of the academy. Vienna at the turn of the century was a center of cultural ferment. It was the place where Sigmund Freud was beginning to publish his extraordinarily influential works on the subconscious as revealed by dreams and the sexual impulse that he saw underlying most human actions and feelings. It was also a hotbed of anti-Semitism. And one reason the secessionist painters came under attack is that they often worked for Jewish patrons who were more open to the works of the avant-garde. If you have time, this video clip will talk about sexual imagery in Klimt's work, more R-rated AP art history. And just in case you didn't have time for the video, here's our old bloodthirsty pal Judith, reincarnated as a sexy femme fatale who lures men to their doom. The model was the wife of a wealthy Jewish businessman. Played into anti-Semitism, even as in some ways it countered it. So this unit contains surprisingly little sculpture. I'm going to throw in a couple of pieces before we get to our required work. 
While this sculpture seems more realistic than impressionistic, although Degas is almost always classed as an impressionist, it introduced a very important innovation that we're going to see a lot more of in this unit and the next. Degas dressed his sculpture in an actual tunic and a real satin haribo. These so-called found objects, as artists would later call them, become important in movements later in the 20th century. Now, our list doesn't include any of Gauguin's sculptures either, but I think this low, wooden low-relief panel is very interesting as an illustration of this whole femme fatale motif that we just saw in Symbolist and in Fin de Siècle painting and actually shows up in Gauguin's work. So here a woman quote, whom a demon takes by the hand, unquote, according to Gauguin, faces the forces of temptation, symbolized in part as a small fox. By the way, the figure with the thumb in his mouth on the upper right is a self-portrait of Gauguin. Gauguin was influenced by Polynesian sculpture. I've included an example from the Marquesa Islands, which is one of the places where Gauguin lived during his sojourn in the South Pacific, and indeed is where he died in 1903. To the right of that is, do you remember? It's the Nukuoro, Micronesian female deity. And do you remember where we encountered this sculpture before? This was the sculpture that featured in the U.S. court case, examining the question, what is art? That is, for tax purposes. Did art as abstract as this count? You remember what the court ruled? Yes, it does. But the same artist created our required sculpture almost 20 years earlier, before he had moved completely into abstract sculpture. So let's hear from another student presenter. Brancusi actually produced several versions of this sculpture. Our required work, which is on the right, is the last. So what evolution do you see in his work? What changes do you see? I'm going to close with this quote from the Romanian sculptor. The artist should know how to dig out the being that is within the matter. Does that remind you of any of our other artists or works? Onward and upward in the 20th century. Up next is Expressionism.